I'm a dementia psychologist by training. More precisely speaking, a dementia psychologist who does school-based research. Many of my studies take place in the elementary, middle school, and high school settings. And I'm crazy about how to make school a better place for promoting positive child and adolescent development. But you know what? Uh, back in grade school, many people told me doing school-based research is painful and also fulfilling. During that time, I didn't quite understand what they meant because intuitively, these two terms did not seem to go hand in hand together. But after doing school-based research myself for eight years, now I understand. Doing school-based research is painful because you have to deal with the hierarchy of school systems. That means you have to, you have to convince many people from different areas to be on board for your study, including superintendent, school board, principal, teachers, parents, and students. Sometimes you have to start over again due to administration change. Sometimes a complaint from parents, teacher, student can kill your whole study. However, it's also fulfilling because I know my research has a real impact on the practice and the policy in the school settings because I know I have the opportunity to leverage my research on student learning. So yes, doing school-based research is challenging, time-consuming, and painful, but also is meaningful and worthwhile. So I think this um, award is not just a recognition for myself, but also a recognition for all the school-based researchers. I'd like to dedicate this award to, especially to those early career researchers who chose to do school-based research. We should be proud of ourselves because we are making a difference in school settings, uh, even though sometimes the impact and change doesn't seem to be statistically significant in the moment. <laughs> okay, so in the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to try to give you a bit more specific about who I am and what I do to define who I am. Um, one of the questions I've been answering in my research is how we can better engage students in school, not just academic learning, but also social aspect of the school environment. So student engagement has been an overarching theme that I've been using to connect different lines of my school-based research, including study focused on context or psychological factors, for example, school climate, classroom quality, school discipline, to students' beliefs like stereotype beliefs, racial academic identities. And this interest in student engagement really came from my professional experience as a practitioner. When I was 23 years old, I took my first full-time job. I would argue it's probably one of the most demanding jobs, a middle school teacher. It's a middle school in a very rural area. In fact, it's in a reservation area for indigenous people in Taiwan. As you can see, it's surrounded by mountains, forests, trees. It's beautiful, but also in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> a majority of students are indigenous people who cope with alcohol influence homes and crippling effect of poverty and discrimination. And many students, they don't see the value of going to school education. And many of them don't feel like adults in the family of school have high expectation for them. So you can see the graduation rate is only 50%, and the attendance rate is 70%. So we got a very serious student engagement issue there. And so my first task is try to figure out how we can engage students, you know, literally how to get them come to school, basically every day. And we're not even close already to talk about how to emotionally or kind of engage students yet. So I decided to start with the relationship building because I believe relationship is set the stage for a lot of wonderful things to happen. I spent time with each kid, not just in school, but also out of school. I try to talk to them. I try to get to know them better. So they, they know, I try to know them, and I, try, I also care about them. I also went to visit each kid's parent to get to know their family background. I spent a lot of time you know, going hiking, mountain climbing, fishing, hunting, and swimming with them. Try to be with them. I made a deal with the kids. If you show me how to hunt, how to fish, and you got to let me show you how to do your homework and how to read. And this relationship building approach turns out to be very successful. I think it really changed the kids' their perception about school. It also changed how they see themselves. And so the class I taught ended up having that 99% attendance rate and 80% graduation rate. 
This first experience really convinced me student engagement is malleable. It's something that can be changed with adequate support and resources. So from now on, and I still remember at the graduation ceremony, one of my students gave me a thank you card. He wrote, thank you, Mr. Wang. Uh, I didn't realize I can write, I can read, I can do math, and school can be fun until you become our teacher. So with that in mind, I think I've been working with my colleague and my research team develops like at least three, sorry, I kind of forgot my slides to show you. Yeah, those are kids. Oh, by the way, this is not our daily dress. You know, as you can see, it's Halloween. Uh, let's try to make you know, uh, learning fun in school setting. So um, I try to develop three types of model when working with the school district. Each model is different depending on who or what initiates the research practice partnership. And the common themes across the three models is uh, I think the results will directly feedback to school to either inform the teaching practice or their decision making. Because I think it's important whenever we work with school, the one of the quick questions they're going to ask you is, okay, great, I mean, your research seems important and interesting, but how can we benefit from your project or research? You cannot just tell them, well, you are contributing to science. Well, that's important, but it's not their priority for sure. So this really prompted me to think about how we can make our research more tangible relevant and meaningful to practice. Because I mean, for ourselves as a researcher, I think our job is to try to provide empirical evidence and to show them what's working and what's not. So I'm going to give you a one research project and as an example to discuss each model and how it works. And please forgive me, I won't be able to give you a lot of detail because I think probably can spend one hour for each model and so please don't be upset with me for not providing uh, details. So the first one is uh, policy driven. So I think we kind of try to respond to the need from the policy. So when the Every Child Succeeds Act was adopted in 2015, uh, many school districts were encouraged to adopt accountability indicator for, of school quality <coughs> Excuse me, and uh, student success. They really, uh, opens opportunity for school to work with the researchers to better understand how we can measure student engagement or school quality or school climate. So during the time, when we were able to talk to school and say, oh, well, you're doing research, great. Uh, do you happen to know any good scales or instruments like uh, we can measure student engagement and school climate? I said, yeah, um, I don't know any good ones on top of my head, but we can work with you to develop one to fit your need if you're interested. And during the time, my colleague, Jennifer Frederick, just finished um, a uh, very comprehensive review on student engagement scales instrument, and she came to a conclusion, we really need an ecologically valid and the theoretical driven uh, instrument that can capture different dimensions of student engagement. And luckily, we, our project got funded. So uh, we worked with school to develop some sort of like multi-method and multi-informant um, scale uh, to capture student engagement in school, but also math and science engagement. And we got a pretty decent sample size, you know, qualitatively and also quantitatively to pilot test and to develop and validate these scales. So what did we find? Um, in addition to the behavior of emotional kind of engagement that's been constantly found in the literature, we also identify a new dimension of engagement, social engagement. Because when you talk about, when you talk to kids, I mean, school is just another place for academic learning. It's more also more like a place for them to hang out with their friends, to socialize with adults and the peers. And we found that social engagement really plays a very unique role, you know, especially sometimes it could be a facilitator or mediator for other dimensions of social engagement to function well. And you can see the uh, more um, fine-grained definition for each one. So this um, instrument turns out to be useful for not just researchers, but also practitioners. Since uh, our scale was officially published in 2016, I think there are already more than 20 school districts using our scale in Pennsylvania. And as far as I know, there are more than five states you know, recommending their school using our scales. 
Also, there are more than 10 languages you know, being translated. So you can see the high demand. And this is a good example how research can be responsive to a policy and to work with the practitioners to do something useful, informative. And the second model is research driven. So it basically initiated by the researcher's intellectual curiosity. So Goldman said this idea has been a sexy science you know, over the past you know, decade. And one of the strategies to promote growth mindset is to use effort praise or to praise students for their effort instead of ability. But my students and I looked into the literature and we found actually the, the most of empirical evidence about the positive effect of using effort praise you know, came from many from study with uh, younger kids. But for study with the uh, adolescents, I think the finding is pretty inconsistent. Most of them either no effect or sometimes even negative effect for using Everpraise. And one of the reasons is that because the adolescents are more sensitive to peer comparison and competition. So when teachers praise for their effort and they may interpret us as something because you don't, you don't think I'm smart. So that's why you praise for my effort. So I think they really got a thinking. I think that's the story probably is more complex than we thought. Uh, also another limitation is that most studies being conducted in a laboratory setting and very few studies have been conducted in the real, actual classroom settings. So we talked to teachers in, about this idea, and they said, oh, well, yeah, this seems very interesting, very tangible, very relevant to their day-to-day -day practice. They also want to learn, okay, how we can better praise students, and what type of praise might be most beneficial for them. So we kind of like, uh, identified different, three different types of praise, ability praise, effort praise, and strategy praise. But we also uh, include uh, uh, task characteristics, task difficulty, and task performance into our study. So the question we try to answer is uh, what types of teacher praise may predict student engagement, and also the same thing for task characteristics. And also, most important of all, the list of association differ by student relationship quality with that teacher. As I say, I think the relationship really sets the stage for learning. So I want to see if that really makes a difference, if they have a good relationship with the teacher. So we use the daily diary method. So we ask students to do a very brief survey by the end of each math class. So we can capture their daily experience. And we include a, a, a verbal and a written feedback from uh, the teachers. It's a very intensive study over three weeks. So you can see that student engagement fluctuates every day, for sure. And that's how we found. You can see each one actually has a different role in promoting student engagement. Let me summarize for you. So timely feedback is important and can have an immediate impact on student engagement. Strategy and ability praise can help students feel good, can enhance their emotional engagement. But every praise can actually promote their content of engagement. Also, providing mastery experience is also important for promoting student engagement. And ethical challenging is also important and have an immediate impact on their content of engagement. How about relationship with the teacher? We found regardless of what type of praise the teacher uses, if they have a good relationship with the teachers, they make the praise more effective beneficial for kids. So what do we learn from this? There's no, every praise is not a major bullet. Different types of praise actually, you know, can have a different role in terms of how they promote student engagement. Also, we need to provide adequate tasks with adequate difficulty so students can have a mastery experience. Most important of all, I think we need to have a good relationship with the students so we can make our praise more effective. Okay, the last one is a practice-driven model. I think using effective school discipline and practice is a challenge, a universal challenge for many schools. And one of the school districts we've been working with, they've been struggling with the high suspension rate nationwide, basically. So they came to us and said, okay, can you help us to figure out our current behavior management practice and policy, if see if they are effective, if not, if any other alternative we can consider using. Great, so then we work together to figure out their current discipline practice. And we know because of zero tolerance approach, and many schools, including this school, and punish students' minor misbehavior, 
with assumption, if we don't stop those minor misconduct, they will become very, very bad and serious later on. However, adolescents may view this punishment for misconduct as over-controlling and in turn may even engage in more serious defined behavior to gain their autonomy or to gain the recognition from their peers. And we don't want that to happen because the defined behavior is strongly linked to school suspension. So we work with the school and try to identify the beginning of the school discipline cycle and where can we identify that and to stop that. And also, and most uh, concern is also racial disparity in school discipline, as we know. Students of color are more likely to be punished or disciplined than their white peers. So here's our research question. We work together with the practitioners. Does minor infraction lead to reduce or increase defined behavior? Are there racial differences in the minor infraction or defined behavior? We work with the urban public school district, um, sixth, eighth, and tenth grade. We use their school record data to look at this minor infraction and defined behavior. This is how we define minor infractions. It's something like violating dress code, using cell phone, horseplay, and this kind of see definition for defined behavior. Here are some descriptive statistics. About more than 50% still receive at least one minor infraction. That's pretty high. And 31% of students receive at least one defined behavior infraction. And 28% of students were suspended at least once in one year. And race was corrected with the suspensions. It means more African-American kids receive more suspension than their white peers. Here's what we found. So when students receive a minor infraction, they were almost two times more likely to receive a defined infraction than next trimester. And students with a defined infraction receive more suspension across the school year. And what's most concerning, African-American students receive more minor infraction than white students, even controlling for their behavior and academic factors. And notably, there were no racial difference in defined behavior infractions. So we know does minor infraction really help us to achieve our goal? Probably not. They're, they're actually, they lead to the more negative consequences. But don't get me wrong, we still need to maintain the, uh, the classroom order, right? But I think the, the point here is that we probably need an autonomy behavior management practice. So we can balance between adolescent autonomy, but also the classroom order. So this is another good example. So right now we're working with the school district to you know, using some evidence-based intervention, so like social ju um, restorative justice practice, as, for example, to really revisit, you know, to kind of like reshape their school discipline practices. So I would like to end my um, talk by giving thanks to those who have been holding my hands throughout the journey and adventure. I'd like to thank my uh, doctoral advisor, co-advisor, Bob Selman. Uh, is a dementia psychologist who has been encouraging me and most of the time pushing me to think like a theorist. So I feel comfortable to use dementia theories uh, to guide my thinking and to interpret my research findings. I also like to thank my um, co-advisor, John Wellett, a statistician and methodologist who provide me with a good solid training on uh, uh, data analysis. And so I always never shy away from using sophisticated analysis to identify and investigate complex uh, developmental trajectories. The last one is my uh, postdoc mentor, Jackie Eichels. As you know, it's an uh, educational and motivation psychologist uh, who brings me into this motivation world and to give me uh, another perspective to understand, uh, address student engagement issues. And of course, I'd like to thank my team and also those schools and who have been uh, welcoming me uh, into their school district and uh, working with me over these past eight years. Thank you so much. <laughs>